And I'm going to introduce now our next speaker, Professor Brenda Cowan from the US. It's Exhibitions and Experience Design, a professional exhibitions and experience design from the Fashion Institute of Technology, who will present her five years international research on museum objects, healing, and well-being. Please, Brenda. Thank you, Sophia. Hello, everyone. What a pleasure to be in Greece right now. Oh my goodness. So, my research work looks at the connections between mental health, human object relationships, and how it is that museums and human object relationships in our museum environments support our mental health and well being. Objects are impactful in our everyday lives. And through my work, I've begun to discover that objects are very similarly impactful in our museum environments. Moreover, they support our well being, they help our mental health and our healing. So, how does this work? I like to use the analogy of thinking about how very much so how our bodies require nutrients in order to stay physically well. So do humans require object encounters in order to stay psychologically well. And I've developed a model for how this works. I call this psychotherapeutic object dynamics. And there are three main component parts to it. Object characteristics, which are subjective. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, object associations, which are subjective. We have object characteristics. And then we have object dynamic actions. And these three component parts work together simultaneously, automatically, to produce therapeutic outcomes. So when we're talking about subjective uh, object associations, this is when an object in our life is not just a thing. But it's meaningful, it's personal. Perhaps it's affiliated with a person or a place or a milestone. It means something. Then let's say that that same object has evocative characteristics. And this is where it gets really interesting. Let's say that meaningful object has uh, a role is like a silent life partner. It's a companion to us, or it's a repository of memories. Perhaps the object has numinous characteristics, almost spiritual or lifelike qualities. There are then dynamic actions of which, to date with my research, there are seven specific dy dynamic actions that humans do with objects where we can see therapeutic, healthful, and healing outcomes. And for the sake of just sharing with you specifically what am I talking about when I'm talking about therapeutic um, outcomes, object encounters directly enable us to develop grit, resilience, endurance. They support our self and identity work. They help fortify our sense of personal power. They can be aids in trauma healing, so that's healing through loss, through grief. They can instill a sense of hope in us, a belief that there is a future. And object encounters are very instrumental in our connection with family and with society. Okay, so what are these dynamic actions that people do with objects every day? Spoiler alert, we do the same thing in museum environments. What are these seven specific dynamic actions? You are going to help tell me. I would like you to raise your hand. If you're remote, raise your hand too because I can feel you. Do you have a meaningful object that you always keep near to you? It's important that it's nearby, even if it's in a box in the closet, or maybe it's something that you wear every single day. It gives you comfort to know this is associating. It's a very common human object dynamic of keeping something physically close. It could also be knowing that there is something in a museum that you can visit often. You ready? Let's try another one. Who here has two or more objects, it could be like a whole collection even, objects that are meaningful only when they are kept together. If the objects were separated out from each other, they would somehow lose their meaning. This is composing. 
and it is the dynamic action of keeping objects close together so that the meaning is integral to the grouping. Let's try another one. I hope everybody's going to raise their hand. Who here has ever given or received an object? Okay, happy birthday, everybody. <laughs> Giving and receiving is a dynamic action that is incredibly powerful to humans. And you can think about it working something like when you offer a gift to somebody else, you're essentially welcoming them into your life. And when that gift is received with its integrity held intact, it is the person saying, yes, I'm with you. It's a very, very powerful dynamic. Okay, who here has ever made an object? You had the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations, you hit the obstacles, the pitfalls, something resulted, and that final object has meaning for you. The dynamic action of making is very much so like it, it emulates the life process. And yes, that's a wooden leg that has been hand carved on display at the Bard Graduate Center because people can even see the marks of the making of an object and have a making response. Who here has ever permanently removed an object from your life? Maybe you had a, a bad breakup and that person's stuff had to go. Maybe you had a really significant spring cleaning and you felt so good afterwards. That's releasing and unburdening. This is, I've come to find, an enormous part of healing through trauma, healing through grief, through loss, and being able to move on. Who here has ever contributed something to a larger collection of objects. Maybe you've made a donation to an important cause. This is synergizing. And this is a very pro-social dynamic action of contributing and feeling like you have become part of something larger than just yourself. It's a tremendous connector. Okay, who here has ever touched an object and felt calmer? There is amazing research. Actually, I think possibly some people who are watching today are absolutely doing amazing things, looking at the relationship between touch and objects and the calming centers in the human brain and our emotional states. These inherent human object dynamics occur in everyday life and come to find out they are also occurring in our museum environments. But where did all of this begin? Back in 2015, I was in North Carolina in the US and I was at a wilderness facility that was therapeutic for teenagers, for adolescents, and many of whom were undergoing pretty profound tragedies. And they were going through therapeutic um, sessions and pro protocols using objects from the woods, sticks, stones, twigs. They were using things like little plastic beads and they were healing through tremendous challenges. And they were performing those dynamic actions that we just discussed. And I wanted to know, are these same dynamics occurring in people's everyday lives? Are we doing them as a part of non-facilitated sort of self-therapy? Self and I began to really see this and I wanted to see, is this part of the museum object dynamic? Is this a powerful part of what makes our museums, I believed, healing in healthful environments? So I set off to find some data and to do some evidence-based research. I spent the next five years uh, going across four different countries, five different institutions. I looked at small institutions, large museums, highly participatory, other museums that were maybe a little bit more passive, very diverse constituencies. 
I began at the National September 11th Memorial Mu Museum in New York. And here I was looking at an institution where I believe that I would be encountering, um, the, with, given the content, a lot of trauma to see what kinds of evidence of health and healing with object donation was occurring. People who are relatives of victims, survivors, first responders, all donating personal objects to the museum's collection, resoundingly expressed release and unburdening of being able to move on from their grief and process this tragedy through being able to donate options. There was giving and receiving, people knowing that their objects were in an associative space. From there, I went to the remarkable War Childhood Museum in Sarajevo. Here, adults who were children during the war years in Bosnia and had saved an object from their childhood were now donating them to the institutions. This is a smaller museum, um, highly recommend it. They're donating their childhood object to the institution's collection. And I heard the same thing giving and being received, releasing and unburdening from grief. Synergizing was an enormous experience. People feeling like they were a part of something larger than just themselves in their own grief alone. And part of what makes War Childhood Museum really important as well is that they have health and they have healing in their mission. I then wanted to look more at well-being. And I set off to Derby, England, to the Derby Museum and Art Gallery. This institution has well-being in its mission. And the galleries are a little bit different. I interviewed staff and volunteers, visitors. And the Derby Museum and Art Gallery has a lot of touch programs, a lot of making programs, highly participatory institution. And I found the same thing. Giving and receiving in a case where people could uh, donate a digital image of a personal object to a digital archive. So it's not even just, you know, objects in person. So digital images, uh, respondents were describing giving and being received, synergizing with the institution, touching of objects, the making of objects. It was a very rich study. From there, I went back home to New York to my home college, FIT, and I worked with our little museum. Now, this institution, which is much more passive, more conventional in its mode of display, features fashion clothing, right? It's all couture. It's very high-end, beautiful items of clothing. And by the way, if any of you has clothing in your collection, you have very powerful objects. Clothing sparks so much of these dynamics that I'm describing to all of you. And here, there is also a digital archive where people could donate a photograph of an item of clothing. Giving and receiving, people would look at the stitch work and the wear and tear on textiles and talk about making and touching. It was truly powerful. Last, most recently, this was 2019 before COVID put a temporary halt on my work and my in-person work, I went to Stockholm at the Museum of Mediterranean and Near Eastern Antiquities. Here, Stories from Syria was this remarkable exhibition that was a collaboration between Syrian refugees and immigrants um, all across the country of Sweden with the institution to create an exhibition where they were loaning a personal object that they had brought with them from Syria for one year. This study was amazing. The Syrian participants described giving and being received, synergizing on a massive level. There was so much pride and gratitude. Participants, the Syrian participants, called the museum their house. This was their house because their personal objects were on display. <clears throat> they called the institution home because the archive 
of ancient Syrian objects in the institution's collection were theirs as well. So, object dynamics have universal themes, and there are many. I'm going to share just three with you for the sake of time. The first is family. When you talk with people about objects, they will refer to them as family members. A woman who wears bracelets, are her, she's wearing her grandchildren. Um, a first responder donated a pair of ash-covered boots to the September 11th Memorial Museum. They are his twin boys who he visits on a regular basis. Another one is preservation of legacy. The whole idea of legacy comes up quite a bit when you talk about objects with people. So I'm interviewing a Syrian woman, and she's feeling tremendous feelings of guilt for having given away her grandmother's kitchen utensils. Several years later, I'm speaking with a, wo a woman of privilege in New York, and she's expressing tremendous guilt at having given away her grandmother's kitchen utensils. The stories are so universal. The last one I'll share is life. People talk about objects, personal objects, objects in museums, objects that they make, that they touch, that they participate with, that they see through glass as being alive. They are numinous. They are spiritual. Object experiences are universal. They connect us. They show us our common humanity. And through objects and object engagement, we are able to heal, and we can see our own institutions, our museums, our cultural centers as places of healing and health. Thank you. Thank you so much. You got us into a completely different spirit to understanding objects as participants in our lives. Oh, they are. They are. As Absolutely. a curator and as an anthropologist, I believe on the, on the life and the biography of objects and what they have experienced through us. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any question for Brenda? Eleni, please. Do we have a mic here? Thank you, Brenda. This was amazing uh, and very personal at the same time, like universal and personal. So have, have you um, codified all this research? Uh, I think you, you wrote a book about it. Yes. So have you codified also the impact, what uh, the deputy minister was talking about, the different impact that the relationship with objects has with people over time? So this fire uh, first responder that visits the twins, his twin boys, what is the process he goes through? How does he end up uh, you know, in six months or one year, mm -hmm. what is the impact in his mental health or his relationship with this object over time? Or is this something that you plan to do? For my data, I have not done a longitudinal study yet, but I can tell you that the first responder, um, it was over a period of 15 years um, that he had, since the time that he had donated, and he visits them on a regular basis. He's there several times a year. Um, and it is, it's a bit of a homecoming. Some of the um, people, for example, at the 9-11 uh, Memorial Museum who have donated will visit it often over the course of 10 years, 15 years more, and talk about how their identity is braided within the institution. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Any other question? One more question, please, if you can state uh, uh, who you are and your affiliation. We are running a bit late, so we'll try to keep it a bit more concise, our discussion, and we will have our break uh, around 10 to 3, hopefully. So do keep time in mind as well, please. Hello, um, my name is Daria Koskoro. Thank you so much for this brilliant um, presentation. Uh, my question is, um, do these 
objects. Um, is this a story of uh, how um, uh, how what, what, uh, the story of the donation, let's say, is this uh, does this become part of the story of the exhibit? And um, do you do you have any uh, data or um, stories of the visitors? And if it if they if this if the story of the exhibit of, of the donation of the exhibit um, affect affects the, the visitor and uh, their emotional and well-being status? Mm. That's a really, really good question. I think that the exhibitions, with the exception of the, the War Childhood Museum, is very, very intentional about its whole exhibition, its whole collection, is very much so designed to enable a therapeutic experience for their object donors. And it, when I was interviewing um, volunteers and staff and visitors, it was a shared experience, these, these very therapeutic, powerful outcomes. But in the other institutions, um, it was a little bit less intentional. The Darby Museum and Art Gallery definitely well-being is a core part, but uh, I was dealing with a World Cultures Gallery, for example, and so the themes were different. They weren't specifically about, you know, we are going to have the story or the narrative experience of the exhibition be about, you know, health and healing. A lot of this is happening, which is part of why I was really excited to come and share this with all of you. A lot of this is happening beyond intentionality and the possibility for thinking in this way and using objects in this way with intention in our exhibitions and as a part of the shaping of the story of the exhibitions, the narrative experiences, is, I think it's, it's limitless. Yeah. True, the potential of including the stories and There's so basically much that can animating be done. the objects with the stories of the people that have to tell for them. Yes. Well, thank you very much, thank Brenda. You. We'll have more time thank to you. discuss. Thank you later today if anybody wants to ask Brenda more questions. She is here physically and she will be here throughout the day.